Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 432. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Lanzalone. Today, joined by co-host Connor Freeman. Connor, how are you doing? Doing well, Kyle. How are you? Doing well. Happy to have you back on the show. We got quite a bit to talk about on today's show. You got a update on what's happening in the Middle East, and we got some news on Russia and China. Uh, all the news is pretty much bad today, so everybody get get ready for this one. Uh, Connor, just want to remind people to share the show. You can find it at the Libertarian Institute on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey for the video version of the show, and it's up anywhere you can listen to podcasts. If you're a new listener, just hit the subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss an episode. If you're a longtime listener, you really like the show, recommend it to somebody, throw it in on, you know, up on your favorite social media, tell people to check it out, help us get out there to new listeners. And Connor, with that, let's get into the news today. This from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com. Zelensky says he's received powerful offer on f teens. Ukrainian President Zelensky said Tuesday that Ukraine has received a powerful offer from countries that are willing to provide there are American-made F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. Since Biden approved the delivery of F-16s from Europe to Ukraine, it hasn't been clear which countries will send their jets. European nations that are expected to arm Ukraine with their F-16s include the Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, but they haven't made a commitment. Zelensky signaled that, signaled that a deal on the aircraft will be reached soon. He said, our partners know how many aircraft we need. I already have received an understanding of of the number from some of our European partners, it's a serious, powerful offer. The Ukrainian leader has said that he is wait- waiting for a final agreement, including a joint agreement with the United States. The U.S. has not made a final decision on whether or not it will send its own F-16s to Ukraine. And so then Dave just mentions here a story that we talked about in the last episode of the show, and that is Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, noting that F-16s can carry nuclear weapons. And of course, you know, that just marks how how significant of an escalation, Connor, this is in the war to send the S-16s to Ukraine. Now, I want to talk about this article that I wrote for uh, the Libertarian Institute. All right, so this article I wrote for the Libertarian Institute titled, Former NATO Head, Some NATO Countries Are Considering Sending Troops to Ukraine. And so I, I think really understanding what he is saying here is important because this is essentially blackmail uh, to Washington, some other European states. The former civilian head of the North Atlantic Alliance is warning that some Eastern European states are prepared to send their soldiers to Ukraine if the bloc does not make a significant pledge to Kiev during the upcoming summit. Anders Rasmussen Uh, He is from, I believe, Denmark and the former NATO secretary general, and very importantly here, a current advisor to President Zelensky, is touring Europe and Washington to gauge the level of support Kiev should expect at the Vilnius summit in July, and this is the gathering of NATO leaders we've been talking about on, I would say, every show over the past few weeks. I think there's going to be some major developments once we get there, Uh, so definitely stay tuned to that, and that's why this is so important. I think the Poles would seriously consider going in and assembling a coalition of the willing if Ukraine doesn't get anything in Vilnius. He said, we shouldn't underestimate the Polish feeling. The Poles feel that for too long, Western Europe did not listen to their warnings against the true Russian mentality. Poland and the Baltic states may send troops to Ukraine if the alliance fails to make a strong enough commitment to Kiev and Lithuania, according to Rasmussen. If NATO cannot agree on a clear path forward for Ukraine, there might be a clear possibility that some countries individually might take action. We know that Poland is very engaged in providing concrete assistance to Ukraine. He continues, I wouldn't exclude the possibility that Poland would engage even stronger in its commitment on a national basis and be followed by the Baltic states, maybe including the possibility of sending troops on the ground. And so, Connor, that would be an extremely serious escalation. Now, there have been Polish, and I'm sure people from the Baltic states as well, from those countries who have gone privately to fight on the side of Ukraine. Uh, I know Russia puts out casualty numbers for Ukrainians and other foreigners occasionally. So uh, we we do already see that, but it would be far different if these are uniformed 
uh, you know, Polish soldiers, Lithuanian soldiers or something like that. Now, I'm not sure this is a serious threat and for a couple of reasons, uh, particularly with the Baltic states, you really don't have a military that is very large and probably capable of defending their own country. And so the idea that Lithuania would be able to send enough troops to Ukraine to make a difference seems unlikely. Now, maybe Ukraine is lacking experienced soldiers and, uh, you know, there are probably soldiers in Lithuania's military that have been there for 5, 10, 15 years and who have a lot of experience. You know, maybe they're a part of the U.S. warfare in Iraq or Afghanistan, and so they couldn't even have combat experience. And, you know, maybe as trainers or something like that, there could be a little bit of an impact. Of course, with Poland, you are looking at a little bit of a bigger military. So, you know, they could deploy some forces or something to try to help out the Ukrainians. But, Connor, I, I don't see this as a real threat. I think what's going on is this is the, you know, Poles, uh, this is Zelensky, and this is the Baltic states doing the best they can to push Washington, London, Paris, uh, Berlin to make the strongest commitment to Ukraine uh, that they can at this upcoming summit. So, Going back to the article here, for several months, members of the North Atlantic Alliance have debated how to upgrade Ukraine's status at the Vilnius Summit. Eastern European members and Kiev are seeking a concrete path to membership with a timeline for Ukraine uh, will be on when Ukraine will be permitted to join the alliance. Some Western European states in Washington do not agree and prefer to focus on the war in Ukraine. A subgroup of the Eastern European countries within NATO, dubbed the Bucharest Nine, issued a statement on Tuesday calling for Ukraine to receive a path to membership at the summit. Uh, we have former French President Emmanuel Macron saying, uh, the current French President, uh, saying last month that Paris will not support full membership for Kiev. However, we did have Rasmussen say that uh, Marcon was beginning to budge on the issue and saying after a slow start, momentum was now building behind these ideas, including in France. Uh, so what he said is he believes that some member states threatening to send troops to Ukraine will push Berlin and others to give Kiev a quick path to membership in the alliance. And so, Connor, I, I think that's really what this is all about, that. They're really not seriously, seriously considering sending troops. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't want to underestimate this and say it's definitely not a possibility. You know, it's not that, you know, maybe this guy has talked to the pre Polish president, Duda, and heard like, oh, hey, we are willing to send troops if, if that's what it comes to, uh, thinking that that would push the other members of NATO to, uh, you know, give more support as it would push, you know, NATO troops directly into the line of fire with Russians and create a direct war between uh, Russia and the NATO alliance. So, again, my guess is this is more blackmail and a threat, but I, I think this is really significant and something to keep an eye on, Connor. Uh, now let's talk about <laughs> some massive war games that are going to be happening. Uh, Germany is preparing to lead NATO's largest ever air deployment exercise in the show of force meant as a warning to Russia. The Air Defender 23 will involve 10,000 personnel, 250 aircraft, including 200 U.S. Air National Guard troops and 100 American planes. The drills will be held from June 12th to the 23rd and, we be, and will be held in Germany, the Czech Republic, Estonia, and Latvia. So this is uh, a pretty significant set of war games here. Connor, we have a quick update on the dam, uh, the Nova Kashkova Dam in Ukraine. This from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. Russia on Wednesday questioned what the U.S. might have known about the Ukrainian plans to attack the Nova Kashkova Dam in southern Ukraine using U.S.-provided HIMAR systems. And, of course, as I talked about in the article that I put out earlier in the week, the Washington Post reported in, 20, uh, in December of 22 that Ukraine was considering attacking the dam during its counteroffensive offensive in the region last year and uh, citing a conversation with the Ukrainian general he said they even conducted a test strike on the dam to see what would happen with the U.S. provided HIMAR so the idea that the U.S. wouldn't have known that the Ukrainians did target a dam with one of our rockets seems unlikely and so my guess is that the Russians are right that the U.S. had some hand in all of this uh, but we're going to continue to hear denials from uh, the U.S., of course. Now, 
Uh, this is unsurprising, but Ukraine rejects calls to freeze conflict for peace talks. And this is uh, re reiterating the position that we have heard from Antony Blinken, our Secretary of State, Jade Sullivan, and others, basically saying that if you're going to have a ceasefire, it's going to, in their words, cement the battle lines in place. And so that would be a win for Russia. Although I don't know how any kind of ceasefire, you, you know, that that's probably what you need to actually start to engage in serious talks to end the war is an end to the killing that's currently going on on the ground. Uh, but the Ukrainians are completely dismissing this. Now, Connor, I have a theory here and I, I'm not sure if this is the case, but I do wonder if the Ukrainians are looking to make a quick gamble to get into NATO, and maybe they're trying to say to the NATO alliance, like, hey, we don't want to have talks or anything like that, because they know if the war ends, then that would probably be a condition. What you know, whatever NATO says to Ukraine on what they have to do to get into the alliance, one of those conditions will likely be the end of the war in Ukraine. And so if they get a commitment from NATO that, hey, you're going to be entered into the alliance after the war is over, maybe then the Ukrainians would suddenly be a lot more interested in talking, feeling like getting interest into the NATO alliance would be worth giving up a part of their territory to Russia or something like that. And so I, I kind of wonder if that's maybe the, the gamble that Kiev is going for here. And while they're pressing so hard to get a concrete path to membership at the uh, upcoming summit. Now, Connor, we have a few articles dealing with the U.S.-China relationship. Blinken expected to visit China soon. Uh, this sounds like good news. Remember a couple months ago, there was a Chinese weather balloon that floated over the United States. And rather than dealing like that in a uh, sane diplomatic way that, you know, a normal nation would react to it, the U.S. used a uh, high-powered aircraft to shoot down the weather balloon and then canceled all diplomatic contact with China over the issue. And so, really, we've been in a hold on diplomacy between the U.S. and China in some time. Uh, we finally had the CIA director, William Burns, take a trip to China last month. Will Porter wrote this up for the Libertarian Institute. And as I pointed out on the show, Connor, this is not typically the role of the CIA director. And I usually don't like saying good things about the CIA director, but I think William Burns is probably one of the better diplomats within the Biden administration. And so him going to China may have started to open up some of the tensions between the two countries and is maybe what's paving the way uh, for Blinken to visit uh, China. Now, this is an important story that Dave wrote earlier in the we for anti warcom France objects to NATO opening liaison office in Japan. And I mentioned this on the last show, I believe, uh, with in, in regards to the statement from the Bucharest 9, because this group of Eastern European nations is very interested in getting NATO to expand and to take on a larger role in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but Paris is against it, uh, saying that they want to focus NATO on the alliance's geographic region, and that is the North Atlantic. So this this it's interesting that France is objecting to this, Connor. I'm not quite sure why, uh, but uh, it is some good news. Uh, now we have the U.S. accusing China of aggressiveness in the Taiwan Strait. This is over uh, the uh, Chinese military interfering with an American uh, vessel that was trying to transit the Taiwan Strait. Uh, not surprised that the U.S. is saying this or that China is starting to interfere more with U.S. ships in the region. Uh, they say it is a violation of their territorial integrity for the U.S. to be uh, in that region. Now, Real quick here, Connor, almost unbelievable. The House Armed Services chair wants China spending bill. And so what happened was Congress, I guess, agreed to a cap on defense spending, $886 billion, And that's not enough for Congress. And so what they're going to do is they're going to, I guess, have that is the main Pentagon funding bill, the main war spending bill. But then they're going to tack on all kinds of other aid. So they're going to have aid packages for Taiwan and maybe a Pacific Defense Inif Initiative package, maybe a defense package for Ukraine. And all of this is going to make, I I'm sure, the, the defense budget a trillion dollars next year. Well, really the war budget, but 
Uh, you know how it works, Connor. Anyways, let me hand it over to you to cover this article that you wrote for the Libertarian Institute. Top Admiral says U.S. ready to fight and win war with China. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're building quite a collection of um, leading military uh, commanders and uh, heads of different departments and branches of the armed services and, and Congress people um, calling for direct war with China and making it very explicit. That's what we're preparing for and that's what's coming. So uh, we can add to that list the um, alarmingly uh, – see. Uh, the man is um, – his name is Admiral John Aquilino. He's the commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. And I watched this um, – I didn't watch the whole interview because it's kind of nauseating. The man – it's really terrifying that this guy has been in charge of the – of 52 percent of the world under Indo-PACCOM uh, since April of 21. So Biden has put this guy in charge of this whole China policy that we've been covering since he came into office uh, practically. So as I write, the commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral John Aquilino, highlighted the military's threatening posture towards China, speaking at the annual meeting of the National Committee on U.S.-China relations last month. The group is known for encouraging engagement between the world's two largest economies. So in yet another confirmation that the White House has overturned the longstanding strategic ambiguity policy regarding Taiwan. Aquilino went so far as to say President Joe Biden and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin have tasked him to win a war against China if Beijing attacks the island. This is from uh, Aquilino. He goes, what I can tell you is the secretary and the president have tasked me with two missions. The first is to prevent this conflict. And then the second one is if I fail at mission one, to be ready and prepared to fight and win. The United States military is manned, trained, equipped, postured, and ready to execute both of those missions. So as far as strategic ambiguity goes, just to you know, recap, per the former approach, which apparently is gone and dead and gone, and the U.S. would never commit to defending or not defending the island against a potential attack on the breakaway province. Critically, strategic ambiguity had aimed to deter Beijing from attempting to retake the island by force, while at the same time discouraging Taiwan's more radical factions from seeking to declare independence. Um, now, in an earlier speech at the conference, so he, he gives a speech and then he sits down with his interlocutor, who I'm going to get to here in a moment, who actually did a fairly good job. Um, what was the scariest thing about this was how ignorant and reckless Aquilino seemed to be. Um, so during his speech, he insists that the policy on Taiwan, including the one China policy, has not changed. And uh, he said, quote, we do not seek an independent tw Taiwan. Uh, Aquilino further claimed that the U.S. does not want war, but seeks only peace and prosperity and stability, not confrontation with China. And both of these claims are belied by the fact that in 2011, the Barack Obama administration launched the pivot to Asia. The policy has been ramped up by each successive president, especially Biden. And the pivot entails the largest military buildup since the Second World War, shifting hundreds of bases as well as two-thirds of all U.S. air and naval forces to the Asia-Pacific region. Washington is encircling China for a future war with Beijing. So the U.S. is committing billions of dollars in military aid to Taiwan. They're expanding U.S. National Guard training programs with the Taiwanese military, signing trade agreements, and continually sending more congressional delegations to the island, deploying higher numbers of U.S. troops to the island, training hundreds of Taiwanese soldiers for war on U.S. soil. They're trying to convert Taiwan into a, quote, giant weapons depot, as the New York Times reported uh, and sailing American warships through the sensitive Taiwan Strait almost every month, as we just talked about. Now, China has made clear that Taiwan is a red line. While the American side promises that they only want to deter war with these actions, Beijing has repeatedly said that they seek a peaceful reunification with Taiwan, but they have not ruled out using force. Washington's actions make war more likely. There's just no two ways about it. And during the last few years, the U.S. has vastly increased the presence of warships and spy planes in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and the Yellow Sea, including near China's coast. Beijing has recently begun responding by taking actions to deter these naval patrols, including in the Taiwan Strait and these U.S. flights in the region. So uh, 
you know, the guy, uh, the Stephen Orleans, um, he sits down for an interview, uh, and then there's a Q and a with Aquilino. But so Orleans is the chairman and chief spokesman of this group. So he asks Aquil- a- Aquilino pretty sensibly, you say, you say we have more dangerous intercepts by the Chinese. Well, the Chinese say, well, there's an easy answer, run fewer surveillance flights. Then there'll be fewer dangerous intercepts. Given the capability of our satellites, do we need to run as many surveillance flights as we do? And can you give us a sense as to how many are actually run these days? And so I didn't put this in there, but Aquilino makes some joke about how he can't disclose that, uh, how many flights we really run. Um, you know, but he's but anyway, he refuses to entertain any culpability for the unstable relations. And his response was, I understand the argument that says if you would just leave, I would be happy. That's an interesting argument. That said, it's just not going to happen. And then Aquilino Aquilino blamed uh, Chinese dangerous and escalatory actions against the U.S. for the situation. But Washington's substantial military interventions in the region are making conflicts and accidents more likely. So according to the South China Sea Strategic Pro, uh, Situation Probing Initiative, you know, the Beijing-based uh, think tank, which you know, catalogs the data on all these surveillance flights and the warships, uh, the warship transits and you know, sending the submarines and the uh, surveillance um, vessels and all these different things into the uh, South China Sea, um, you know, we're able to keep track of it. Dave's been writing those up for years at antiwar.com. You know, their report from about the situation last year was pretty interesting. So you know, he says he can't say how many there are, but they reported that, quote, there were about a thousand sorties by large U.S. reconnaissance aircraft into the South China Sea region, some as close as 13 nautical miles from the baseline of China's mainland territorial waters. There were eight entries by U.S. Air, uh, aircraft carrier strike groups and amphibious uh, alert groups and at least 12 by nuclear pa- uh, powered uh, attack submarines. And so an important point about the aircraft carrier strike group um uh, deployments to the South China Sea. Uh, it would seem, um, you know, because we all remember that in, in, in 2021, Biden escalated those pretty significantly over even what Trump was doing in 2020. So uh, there was a piece in Business Insider that covered this um, about how, you know, Biden sent aircraft carrier strike groups to the South China Sea 10 times uh, in uh, in 2021, as opposed to Trump, who only did it six times in 2020. So it would seem, you know, on the surface, like they're, they've been decreased, you know, since last year uh, over, you know, if you compare it to 2021, but that's not true. So what happens is they send the aircraft carrier strike groups into the South China Sea, but the difference is the deployments are much longer now. They go there on an average for more than 10 days at this point. So even though he was de- making more deployments in 2021, they were there for usually an average of four to six days. So, you know, it's much more extensive deployments and even more provocative, uh, arguably. And so Aquilino uh, censured China over the breakdown in communication between the two militaries. And this became a very uh, sensitive topic in the conversation. And Orleans asked, well, the minister of national defense is sanctioned by the U.S. government. Can our military take a position on whether that's a good policy? In other words, if he's sanctioned, it's highly unlikely he's going to answer the phone. And of course, Biden's refusal to lift sanctions on Chinese defense minister Li Shangfu was cited by Beijing as a reason for not holding a meeting between the two military chiefs at the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore last week. And um, Aquilino just basically blows this off and goes, oh, well, I don't think the sanctions actually prevent Li from picking up the phone, which is just such a you know, stupid way of looking at it. They're not going to just get slapped in the face and then say, well, can we talk? Um, it's absolutely unprofessional and they should, they should lift those sanctions immediately. Um, and, uh, but they don't, you know, he didn't seem to be too concerned. I mean, he feigns concern, but he's not doing anything or insisting to his superiors that there needs to be a change in policy so that there can be clear communication between these militaries. His attitude is, well, if that's the way they want it, you know, that's the way they're going to get it and we're not going anywhere and we're going to keep ramping this up. And so having none of it, he just simply warns, We're postured in the appropriate places. The United States does not choose to escalate. We are not being provocative, but I'm confident that we'd be able to fight and win wherever it went. He continued asserting that there is no one trick pony here that we utilize to both deter and then if we were to unfortunately get into any kind of a conflict. For the United States, it's the synchronization integrated efforts of the entire joint force under sea, on the sea, above the sea, in space, and cyberspace. So if anyone were to choose to take on the United States, they're going to get the full Monty. 
So, you know, he's just very hawkish. Uh, he came off very, um, uh, he didn't come off like an intel a very intelligent guy at all. It was pretty embarrassing and scary actually to see the way he uh, conducted himself here. And um, you know, I recommend people check it out. Actually, that that top quote that I have uh, about the Taiwan about how he's been tasked by Austin and Biden to win a war over Taiwan. If you click that, I have it time stamped right there. And shortly afterwards. Uh, there's some pretty embarrassing moments. Uh, he, the guy asks him, uh, you say that China is, has, is in your speech, you said that China is engaged in the largest military buildup of any country since world war two, but doesn't the U S spend more on the, on, on the, its military, uh, than the next 10 countries combined and many of which are U S allies. And, uh, he goes, well, uh, I, I, I'd ha- I guess I'll have to defer to you on the math about that. But I, I just like to point out that, numbers lie and liars use numbers. And then he just looks out to the audience with this, you know, vacant look on his face. It's very, um, yeah, it's very disturbing to have this guy who just has uh, essentially no professionalism at the helm. And apparently, uh, you know, Avril Haines is, uh, the one who made the comment earlier this year that, uh, Biden's, you know, supposed gaffes about how the U S is committed to sending our men and women to the Island of Taiwan to fight a potential of, you know, a war that would you know very quickly escalate to the nuclear scenario, uh, to defend the Island, which is just a, simply a breakaway province under U S policy of China. It's a part of China. And, uh, he's saying that we'll go over there and we'll go to world war three and fight him for it. And Avril Haines told, I believe it was the house intelligence committee, uh, last or earlier this year, that look, the policy has changed, and uh, the Chinese can take the president at his word. And so, again, we're just con- continually confirming that the strategic ambiguity, that whole era is gone, and they are preparing for it. You know, I mean, it. You know, they're not setting up for a proxy war the way we have with Russia. They're actually preparing to go to direct war with China over Taiwan. Uh, so, okay. So uh, enough of that. We're going to move on to the Middle East where Israel is causing all kinds of problems again, or as usual. And so they're launching these drills, uh, preparing for a multi-front war. And we have the, the chief of CENTCOM visiting. These guys are, are just, uh, you know, really out there looking out for the interests of the American people. Uh, so this is from June 1st. Israel launched major military drills, uh, preparing for war with Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran on Monday. Uh, the exercises, Israel's largest since chariots of fire in May 2022, aim to simulate a conflict uh, which begins with fighting in the north and then spreads to other fronts, and namely Iran. So the IDF said in a statement, the Joint Chiefs of Staff exercise firm hand began today and will last for about two weeks. The exercise will simulate multi-arena combat in the air, the sea, land, el- the electromagnetic spectrum, and in the cyber arena. Uh, Now, reportedly planned for some time, these drills are being led by the Northern Command's 91st Galilee Division, which is responsible for fighting Hezbollah, and the 36th Gash Golan Armored Division, which oversees operations at the border with Syria and the occupied Golan Heights. So according to the Jewish News Syndicate, quote, in the most extreme scenarios, the exercise simulation expands to include direct hostilities with Iran. And the IDF statement continues, the, Israelis army, uh, the Israeli army's ability to be prepared for a prolonged campaign in several arenas will be tested as a part of this exercise. And then a military source told the outlet that there will be hundreds of aircraft uh, in the air of all types, such as fighter jets, including F-35s, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and helicopters. And the report said that the scenario being tested will be markedly different from Operation Shield and Arrow, Tel Aviv's uh, bombing campaign in Gaza last month. So... This is, I think this is very notable, uh, and uh, we should be pretty concerned about this because for Chariots of Fire, I think Kirilla more or less just made an appearance. Whereas this, in this instance, it looks like he's actually participating in the drills, which is very uh, alarming because there were earlier reports that the U.S. would actually participate with air refueling aircraft in Chariots of Fire. Uh, last year, which was a massive drill where they were training in part for bombing Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, but uh, ultimately, the U.S. didn't do that, although it was being um, it was being sort of hyped in Isra- in the Israeli press before it turned out that it was just hype. Um, you know, Kirilla did visit, but they didn't you know, they didn't actually participate. So anyway, here's his this is what he was doing over there this time. So on Tuesday, we have um, 
the Israeli defense minister, Yohav Gallant, hosting General Michael Carilla, the commander of CENTCOM, for a three-day visit. So Gallant, along with the IDF chief of staff, Lieutenant General uh, Herzi Halevi, updated Carilla on the achievements of Operation Shield and Arrow, uh, where Israeli forces killed 33 people in the besieged open-air prison. Uh, in Gaza and in Tel Aviv, Carilla joined a situational assessment at the IDF General Staff Operations Center amidst firm hand and participated in an operational panel with Halevi discussing, quote, ways to boost joint capabilities and coordination. General Carilla also visited the Israeli military's notorious Unit 504, which anticipated the CIA's rendition and torture program after 9-11, according to the Electronic Intifada. And Gallant's office issued a statement thanking Carilla for his great contribution to the ongoing cooperation. This comes as tensions between the U.S., Israel, and Iran have been heading toward a boiling point. The Joe Biden administration has refused to return the, to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal. They've imposed still more sanctions on the Islamic Republic and uh, the Islamic Republic, and tacitly endorsed several Israeli drone strikes and assassinations in Iran, as we covered extensively last year. And the U.S. has also expressed a desire now to jointly plan attacks on Iran with Tel Aviv last month, according to these reports we've been talking about from Axios. And um, earlier on Thursday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in a statement, quote, I have a sh he put out a video message about this last Thursday after we recorded our show. And he said, I have a sharp and clear message for both Iran and the international community. Israel will do whatever it needs to do to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons. And Netanyahu's war threats came just one day after the Associated Press reported on some positive developments between Iran and the IAEA, the UN nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, because um, Tehran had resolved some uh, concerns about its civilian energy program. If Israel was truly concerned about Iran's alleged um, pursuit of nuclear weapons, they would support the JCPOA, which mandates the most comprehensive IAEA inspections regime ever implemented. And so I just note here that as Ted Snyder is... Uh, who works with us at the Libertarian Institute and Antiwar.com has noted, prior to the U.S. illegally pulling out of the JCPOA, Iran was in full compliance with its JCPOA commitments. There were 11 consecutive IAEA reports that verified Iran was completely and consistently in compliance with their commitments under the agreement before the Trump administration illegally exited the, the, uh, the agreement. And in any case, Iran... Um, has been a signatory of the Non-Proliferation Treaty for more than 50 years, since 1970. Israel's never signed the MPT due to its open secret nuclear arsenal, which is thought to contain hundreds of weapons. And I always like to add that because of um, the the Glenn Symington uh, amendments to the U.S. foreign assistance laws in the 70s, that technically makes all of our aid to tell to Israel, military and otherwise, illegal. Um, so, yeah, that's the whole... You know, our participation with Israel beyond all the uh, behind beyond how immoral it is when they're when they have an apartheid state and they're bombing this open air concentration camp and starting wars with their neighbors and, help, you know, pushing using their fifth column to lie us into like the Iraq war and things like that. This is, um, you know, it's all just illegal from, you know, just even in terms of the aid. So, OK, so now it, it, this escalates. So this next story I wrote was from the fifth. And this is Netanyahu threatens Iran, slams IAEA amid major war drills. <laughs> I figured he was going to have some response to the IAEA working out these issues with uh, with Iran. So Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ramped up his threats of war against Iran and slammed the International Atomic Energy Agency for cooperating with Tehran on Sunday. Netanyahu's warning was included as part of a video statement recorded from Tel Aviv's underground command bunker at Israel's military headquarters where a rare cabinet war drill uh, was convened. This is a part of firm hand. So the Israeli leader reemphasized his willingness to launch a preemptive war, including bombing the country's nuclear facilities, ostensibly if international diplomacy, which he's always trying to sabotage, fails with Iran. And so he says, we are committed to acting against Iran's nuclear drive, against missile attacks on Israel, and the possibility of these two f these fronts joining up, Netanyahu said. And the stepped-up threats come as, come as Israel is carrying out this two-week series of military exercises, as I said, eyeing a war with Hezbollah, Syria, Iran. And so since taking power last December, the current regime in Israel, Netanyahu's government, has waged a brutal bombing campaign in Gaza, as I said, killed 33 people. But he's double, doubled the number of air raids in Syria, which before he returned to power, these bombings were already happening about every week, sometimes more than that. And so he's conducted further, he's further conducted strikes even in Lebanon, 
Uh, and uh, he's conducted drone attacks in Iran, too. So additionally, Israeli forces and settlers have killed at least 119 Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem so far this year. In fact, the IDF just shot a two-year-old boy in the head who succumbed to his wounds on Monday. Um, you know, from the, uh, the legendary um, anti-occupation activist family, the Tamimi family from uh, Nabi Saleh, the, uh, the village um, outside of uh, Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. And uh, people will remember Ahed Tamimi, who was a great activist, uh, um, who's uh, very much in the news a few years ago during the Great March, I believe around the time of the Great March of Return protests in Gaza. Um, and, um, anyway, they killed this very cute little boy. There's pictures all over. You can take a look at the, the IDF. Don't deny it. They just say that, well, we thought he was a Palestinian fighter. They shot a two year old boy in the head and killed him. And they shot his father in the chest too. Um, it's just absolutely, uh, disgusting and, uh, horrible. But so keeping this in mind, while Netanyahu is flanked by his security cabinet ministers and defense chiefs. Netanyahu warned that the possibility of a multi-front war means Israeli leadership must, quote, consider, if possible, consider ahead of time the major decisions. And earlier, Netanyahu took aim at the IAEA after the Vienna-based org, uh, you know, re resolved these outstanding inquiries with Iran over its energy program, its nuclear energy program. Uh, and I just say here that the concerns put to rest pertain to some of the un uh, the those the so-called undeclared nuclear sites. This is an allegation that has its origins with the Israelis where trace particles of unprocessed uranium have been found previously, as well as some recently discovered highly enriched uranium particles. And Netanyahu blasted the IAEA's success with Tehran, including, you know, reinstalling some monitoring equipment originally put in place under the JCPOA, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, which, uh, you know, was they was, they disconnected it because I believe this is some of the same equipment that was disconnected last year when under pressure from the Americans and the Israelis, the IAEA was heavily politicized. Um, and they refused to accept the information that was being provided by Iran in their, their documentation. And even though they were allowing the inspectors access to the sites, um, they were allowing the censures to come out, um, with the, uh, being led by the Americans at the board of governors meetings. And so, uh, I mean, just as a response to that, they disconnected some of this, um, some of these cameras, which they didn't even have to have, um, plugged in and, you know, active in the first place, all the, um, all the camera equipment that's necessary as part of their safeguards agreement under the MPT, that's all still activated and was never disconnected. But, you know, if the U.S. isn't abiding by the deal and Israel is attacking them and the U.S. is expanding sanctions and the IAEA is so politicized that they won't uh, be honest and deal with uh, Iran in good faith, then they had to take some sort of a response. But it looks like some of that is being um, rectified. And uh, the Israeli leader declared Iran is continuing to lie to the IAEA, <laughs> insisting the agency's capitulation to Iranian pressure is a black stain on its record. Without providing evidence to support his claims, of course, Netanyahu said Iran's explanations are technically impossible and that the agency is politicizing the issue and endangering its own credibility. Um, and as we talked about, you know, the 84, the 83.7% um, enriched uranium, there's some particles that were discovered. Uh, the IEA agreed with Iran that that was a result of cascade configuration that can happen in fluctuations, and it's just a byproduct of their current enrichment, the highest limit of their pledged upper limit of which is 60%, which they... They only do that, that, you know, they enrich uranium, hex, some uranium hexafluoride to 60% as leverage to eventually get the Americans back to the negotiating table. Not that it appears to have worked yet, but, you know, the IAEA concurred with all of this evidence that they put forward. And then they explained that, um, you know, a former member of the IAEA, uh, a member state operated a mine in Iran uh, at the uh, one of these undeclared sites that was inspected recently. I forget the exact name of the site off the top of my head right now, but uh you know, apparent, uh, some of these subsequent reports are saying that it was a Soviet state that may have owned um, may have owned and operated the mine at the time. But they were just saying that some of the tools and and operations that were gone there at the time may explain why these particles were discovered years later. And the IAEA uh, seemed to agree. And so they said that we have no other outs. We have you know, we consider this matter closed as of now. And so now there's just about two more uh, issues that they have to go over with the undeclared sites. I, I've linked to the explanations and all this that people want to read up more about it uh, in the article. But, um, you know, so I just put here that 
as as the agency, uh, so he says it's technically impossible, and the agency is politicizing the issue and endangering its own credibility. However, as I've said, coming under pressure from the U.S. and the Israelis in the E3 in recent years, the watchdog group has been increasingly politicized against Tehran, if anything. So the issue of the unprocessed uranium traces found at what have long been dubbed the undeclared sites um, is highly controversial because the trace particles themselves never posed any proliferation risk to begin with, but the allegation has long been used by Washington and Tel Aviv to thwart any diplomatic progress on saving the JCPOA. So Iran provided the IEA with full documentation on these inquiries last year, had inspectors uh, you know, visit the site, and only now is the Islamic Republic's cooperation being officially recognized, something which the White House had actively opposed up until now. So we don't really know you know, why that is. Maybe we'll find out soon. Maybe it has something to do with these talks that are uh, potentially being mediated by uh, Oman right now. Um, maybe they're making more headway than we thought. Who knows? But I wouldn't hold my breath about it. But for their part, the Israelis have railed against the JCPOA, hailed the U.S. maximum pressure sanctions campaign and called for a credible military threat against Iran. And then I just, you know, go over the fact that, of course, the not just the MPT, but you know, the Pentagon and Burns, as you mentioned earlier, who's, um, you know, frankly, doing the work of a diplomat when he comes out and has to say at least twice already since Biden came into office that, no, actually, the Israelis are not telling the truth. Iran is not seeking a nuclear weapon. And, of course, the Pentagon has admitted as much recently in the latest nuclear posture review in the um, national defense strategy. So. All right. Now, um, Okay, this piece is from Dave DeCamp on June 6th. Uh, Iran open, reopens embassy in Saudi Arabia. So this is some great news. On Tuesday, Iran reopened its embassy in Saudi Arabia after a seven-year closure, the result of the normalization deal between Tehran and Riyadh, which was brokered by China. Now, during a ceremony at the embassy in Riyadh, Iranian Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Ali Reza... Big Delhi uh, hailed the ties between the two nations. He said, we consider today an important day in the relations of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The cooperation between the countries is entering a new era. The opening of the Iranian embassy coincided with uh, Antony Blinken's arrival in Saudi Arabia. Blinken is expected to meet with the crown prince. Uh, well, we'll cover this in a moment. But yes, he uh, met with MBS and wanted to hype, push the uh, Saudi-Israeli normalization project. Um, but that seems unlikely as Riyadh is focusing on boosting ties with Iran and recently restored diplomatic relations with Syria. A major aspect of this push, of course, is to build this anti-Iran alliance in the region. OK, now. Um, OK, so I'm going to cover this next piece from Dave on June 7th. This is CENTCOM says it conducted 38 operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria in May. So. Um, OK, so U.S. Central Command said in a press release on Tuesday that it conducted 38 operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria in May, killing eight alleged ISIS operatives and detaining 31 more. The command said that all the operations were launched with partners referring to the Kurdish-led SDF in Syria and the Baghdad-based government in Iraq. CENTCOM said that it involved 21 partnered operations in Iraq and 17 in Syria. In Iraq, uh, the command claimed 11 alleged ISIS operatives were detained and six were killed. In Syria, 20 alleged ISIS operative, operatives were detained and two were killed. CENTCOM did not offer an assessment on potential harm to civilians in the operations, and the Pentagon is notorious for undercounting civilian casualties. And so as we've been covering, you know, also in May, CENTCOM launched a drone strike in northwest Syria that killed that sheep herder, uh, Lofti Hassan Misto, uh, who was 56 years old and a father of 10, had no connections to militant organizations. I mean, he was targeted while he was herding his sheep. And CENTCOM initially lied and said that the strike killed a senior al-Qaeda figure, but it was later revealed that they had no evidence to back up their claim. And while the U.S. is active in operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, the terror group no longer holds any significant territory in either country. The U.S. uses these missions against ISIS to justify its continued presence in the region, including the occupation of eastern Syria. Um, but as we've covered, the occupation is part of the economic campaign against Damascus. Um, it's not about ISIS and involves crippling economic sanctions that are specifically designed to prevent Syria's reconstruction. The U.S. recently slapped new sanctions on Syria, likely a response to the country being brought back into the Arab League as the U.S. opposes regional countries normalizing with Syria. OK, so I believe this is our last story. Uh, I wrote this one up last night. Blinken pushes Saudi Israeli normalization during a meeting with MBS. So Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman 
uh, for an opening candidate conversation on Wednesday. This is the words of a U.S. official speaking to Reuters. The discussion covered a wide range of bilateral issues, including potential Saudi-Israeli normalization in the war in Yemen. The top U.S. diplomat visited Jeddah soon after the Saudis in a bid to raise flagging oil prices pledged to deepen output cuts on top of a broader OPEC plus agreement aimed uh, aiming to limit supply. Now, the U.S. has opposed these moves, arguing they will indirectly benefit Russia, a major energy exporter in the midst of the U.S. led sanctions blitz, which Riyadh has refused to join. I think they're also definitely concerned that it'll you know, have an, the effect of raising gas prices as we look toward the coming elections. Um now, a significant chunk of Blinken's meeting with MBS was supposed to focus on promoting Saudi-Israeli normalization along the lines of the Abraham Accords, but the Gulf monarchy has already made clear that that's impossible without a two-state solution for occupied Palestine. Now, Tel Aviv and Blinken appear so eager to get a deal with Riyadh that uh, to get a deal that Riyadh may have uh, substantial leverage to exact concessions from Washington. Uh, in the form of security guarantees and assistance in setting up a civilian nuclear energy program, both of which Saudi Arabia is reportedly seeking. Now, without providing further details, the U.S. officials said they discussed the potential for normalization of relations with Israel and agreed to, con to continue dialogue on the issue. I'm hoping there's going to be more leaks uh, about, you know, more of the details on what they really did uh, discuss on these various topics. But so I write, ties between Washington and Riyadh have frayed further as the Saudis continue to stake out a more independent foreign policy. On Tuesday, this is pretty great, MBS hosted President Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela, another country heavily sanctioned by the U.S., and that's the day Blinken arrives. You know, The Saudi kingdom has also restored uh, full diplomatic relations with longtime adversary Tehran after this deal brokered by uh, Beijing – who is now taking on uh, striving for a larger role in the region. And U.S. officials have downplayed the breakthrough with uh, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby saying it really does remain to be seen whether the Iranians are going to honor their side of the deal. Yeah, because the Iranians are the ones who, you know, you can't trust to honor their side of uh, deals that you make. That's hilarious. So the two former rivals continue to bolster bilateral ties. Iran reopened its embassy, as we just said, at the day Blinken arrived in Saudi Arabia. And I think there's something poetic about that. Now, the U.S. has been left blindsided in the words of William Burns. Uh, however, as the Joe Biden administration works to expand its maximum pressure sanctions campaign on Iran and build this NATO style alliance with Tel Aviv and Arab nations to target the Islamic Republic using, you know, pretty openly the Abraham Accords as a as a foundation. Now, instead, the United Arab Emirates has withdrawn from a U.S.-led maritime coalition, and Tehran has announced that it is working to form a naval alliance with Arab states, including Riyadh and Abu Dhabi. And so in another challenge to the U.S. grip on the region, Saudi has also normalized with Damascus. The White House strongly opposes Arab countries doing this, welcoming in Syria from the cold after the failed U.S.-led regime change war, and Washington still seeks to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad. And Israel frequently bombs a country, and the United States illegally occupies roughly one-third of the Syrian territory and maintains crippling sanctions on the war-torn nation. And despite American resistance, however, Syria is readmitted into the Arab League last month, from which it had been suspended for over a decade, and Riyadh has actually called uh, for all foreign forces to leave Syria. Um, Blinken's sub subsequent remarks before a Gulf Cooperation Council ministerial meeting in Riyadh indicates the White House is not yet adjusted to these seismic regional shifts. He said, we are determined to find a political solution in Syria that maintains its unity and sovereignty and meets the aspirations of its people, because that's what that's what Blinken really cares about. He remains an avid supporter of Biden's regime change policy in Damascus. So aspirations would include getting rid of Assad, no doubt. And he opened his speech by declaring that, the, you know, despite the flowery language, and he opened his speech by declaring the U.S. is collaborating with countries in the region to widen and deepen the normalization of relations with Israel. He opened with that. Um, uh, now, allying with Israel against Iran and the Palestinians in exchange for weapons deals may be increasingly unpopular. Um, and I just go through the fact that, you know, since Netanyahu came to power in December, as I said earlier, he's killed about 150. Actually, it's more than that, 100, more than 150 Palestinians. He's bombing Syria, Gaza, Lebanon, drone striking Iran, threatening war with Iran. Um, he said America, Blinken said America is in this region to stay. And we remain we remain deeply invested 
in partnering with all of you. Blinken continued going on to boast of Washington's determination to counter Iran's destabilizing behavior, including, he said, Tehran's recent seizure of two oil tankers in the Persian Gulf. He failed to note that days prior to Iran's actions, the U.S. took control of the Suez Rajan, confiscating a taker carrying Iranian oil to China. Over the last several years, the U.S. has stolen several Iranian oil tankers and sold them off for profit. While Israel has attacked more than a dozen of Iran's tankers carrying oil to Syria. And uh, in both Blinken's speech, the GCC foreign ministers and his meeting with MBS, he talked about ending the war in Yemen. Now, this is, you know, kind of a difficult one because, again, just like what they, the rhetoric about Syria, they do not want to accept that Assad is in power in Damascus. They never will. And it doesn't, we don't really know yet, but the it's looking like they feel the same way about the Houthis. And they the Biden administration may be hoping to get that war started again, uh, as we've discussed. So I say as state as I write, a State Department spokesman said that Blinken and the crown prince expressed their mutual commitment to a, quote, comprehensive political agreement to achieve peace, prosperity and security in Yemen. However, it does not appear the U.S. is interested in promoting peace between the Saudis and the Houthis who are currently engaged in these uh, Omani-mediated talks. The Houthis have held the capital city of Yemen since the end of 2014, before the Saudi-led coalition began bombing the country. There have been no strikes from either side for more than a year, and Riyadh is eager to end the war, and the Houthis are desperate to lift the Saudi blockade on northern Yemen. Although, as The Intercept's Ryan Grimm has reported, the Biden administration seems to be attempting to slow walk and blow up the peace talks. And this is done under the guise of a benign desire for a comprehensive agreement with an inclusive government, which includes the defeated U.S. and Saudi-backed proxies. And Grimm writes, the Saudis appear eager to get a final deal, get to a final deal, while the U.S. keeps throwing up new conditions. Tim Lenderking, the U.S. Special Envoy for Yemen and other officials, have actively dampened optimism for peace. And the U.S., uh, just always bears repeating, has fully supported the Saudi-led coalition since 2015, even as it waged a starvation and bombing campaign against the civilian infrastructure, uh, you know, with the blockade that by late 2021 killed as many as 377 people, according to UN estimates. And the vast majority of those, uh, the people that were deprived to death or killed with disease were babies and children under the age of five. So this, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, when Blinken says that all we care about is prosperity and peace for the Yemeni people, it's very hard to take that seriously, especially since his uh, he has bylined that war as much as anybody going back to the Obama administration. But all right, that is uh, that's uh, all I got for today. All right, Connor, thank you so much for that update. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show. Share the show if you can. We'll be back with more episodes next week. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everybody.